So thank you so much to everyone that has made time to join us for today's echo session. This is an extraordinary echo session, uh, primarily in view of the COVID-19 situation that we are currently experiencing. As you all know, we are in the third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in Zambia. And we'd like to remind everyone to ensure that we are adhering to the five golden rules uh, acquiring COVID-19. And for participants on the call that are taking part in a group, please remember to maintain physical distancing, maintain um, that social distancing, wear your masks and keep your hands sanitized. And also, remind you of the echo etiquette do not unmute your microphones unless you are requested to speak or you have a question and you're on the floor so thank you so much so today we will be having a presentation for about half an hour led by dr jonas heinz from cdc and we have a panel of experts uh, we have dr tamba tamba and we have dr lia pasikazwe my name is Dr. Singini David from the side as TB Lawn. Thank you so much to everyone that has joined. So before we start our presentation, allow me to just ask Dr. Heinz to introduce himself, tell us his role, and also if he has any declarations of interest. Dr. Heinz. Thank you, Doctor. My name is Jonas Heinz, and I'm the surveillance advisor with, with uh, USCDC. Zambia country office. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Tamba Tamba, Dr. Sikazwe, are you on the call? Just to ensure that our experts are on the call. Dr. Tamba Tamba. Okay, so our experts will join us as we go on. Um, I also like to recognize other experts that are on the call that will be assisting us in responding to some of the, the questions and comments, especially in the chats. So we thank you so much for your availability. At this point, I'll invite Dr. Heinz to take us through the, the presentation, and then we'll, 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 we'll have our discussions immediately after. Dr. Heinz, would you like us to share from our end or you will share from there? Um, I'll share. Let's see. So much. So I have it in presentation mode. Are you getting the full screen or the notes version? No, we are in full screen mode. Great. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining the call. Today, I'll be discussing home management for COVID-19 with patients with mild symptoms. The purpose of my talk is to give an overview of home management of COVID-19. And I will, I'll speak to some of the conceptual um, ideas behind it, but I think that the, the, we'll really look forward to the conversation with the experts who are actually implementing home-based care in Lusaka and Southern provinces. So these are the learning objectives to understand the criteria for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases that can be managed outside health facilities, to understand management guidelines for COVID-19 cases without critical illness, and to showcase home-based care lessons learned from Lusaka and Southern provinces. So just briefly, this is a situation update of uh, the COVID pandemic in Zambia. So the table on the left shows the three different waves when they occurred, the number of cases and the number of deaths. We're currently in the midst of the third wave, which started in late May. And there've been around, there've been over now 20,000 cases and over 120 deaths. These, uh, the, the parameters are shown as the graphs on the right-hand side, the number of cases, the hospitalizations, and the deaths. And these numbers continue to climb 
a daily basis. So a bit of background on COVID-19. Many of you on the call probably already know that already know this, but it's a respiratory illness that's caused by a virus named severe acute respiratory coronavirus 2. The incubation period, which is the time from when you become exposed to when you be, become uh, set or starting to be infectious, is around four to five days, but it can be up to 14 days or two weeks. And the, the symptoms really vary. It can vary from asymptomatic infection just with shedding of the virus to severe illness, including acute respiratory distress syndrome and death. And the breakdown of the proportions shown by that graphic on the right, roughly half of people who become infected are asymptomatic, but still able to spread the virus. Amongst the remaining, almost every, the majority will experience a mild illness and only a small proportion will have a severe illness or die. But given that it's a new virus, and there's no prior existing immunity and infections are so widespread, even though only a small proportion will die, there's infections are so, there's so many infections occurring that we're actually seeing a significant impact in Zambia and uh, around the world. Severe illness and death are more common in people with older age or in, in some pre-existing comorbidities like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Typically, people recover in one to two weeks, but it can last for months. And there is a condition called post-COVID condition where symptoms can persist. So this table shows the different categories for infection severity, with asymptomatic at the top, then mild to moderate disease, which is just characterized by basically an upper respiratory tract infection, fevers, headaches, myalgias, fatigue, sore throat, smell and taste abnormalities, nausea, diarrhea. Um, but notably in mild and moderate disease, they, the patients have normal oxygen saturation. Different cutoffs have been reported, but here I'm, I have 94%. And then severe disease is, is characterized by uh, defects in oxygenation, so low oxygen saturations. The patient may also just have respiratory distress. So just briefly, management of mild disease is aimed at preventing further spread through infection control and managing symptoms with over-the-counter medicines like paracetamol and cough drops. You can recommend to patients to do breathing exercises, which may give them um, some peace of mind and also help uh, expand their lungs. And there's a link shown there in case people wanna follow that after the talk to, to see what the specific recommendations are around those. There's also monoclonal antibodies, but these are not widely available in Zambia. And then there's experimental therapies that are being tested in clinical trials right now, including colchicine, ivermectin, inhaled corticosteroids, and others. But of note, there is no role for steroids, lopinavir, ritonavir, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or antibiotics in the management of mild COVID. So why do we have a home-based care system or model? The reason is, is twofold. One is that most people have a mild illness if they have symptoms at all, and so they don't require hospitalization. But the other has to do with the supply side of COVID um, resources in Zambia. So to date, there have been over 113,000 cases um, and only 18,000 in June alone. Of, um, of those, there's around 13,000 active cases, and the vast majority of these people are being managed in the home-based care model. And you can see on the right-hand side, the table that demonstrates the resources in Zambia for managing patients in, inpatient. And clearly there's a mismatch between the number of active cases and the amount of space that's available to manage people, uh, patients in, uh, inpatient. So there simply isn't the capacity to take care of all people with COVID in an uh, inpatient setting. The origins of the home-based care model in Zambia date back to the Nukonde district outbreak about a year ago in May. There was a large outbreak in the border town of Nukonde and cases quickly overwhelmed the health system's ability to isolate everybody. So clinicians and com community members were mobilized to care for patients in their homes. So that's where the home-based care model started and it's been implemented since then across the country in various forms. So here's poll question number one. Are we going to um, be able to post the questions or should I just, oh yeah, great. So I'll, read, I'll go so ahead and read it. 
Oh, go ahead. All right. Uh, the first poll question reads, which of the following are reasons for using home-based care model for COVID-19? Which of the following are reasons for using the COVID, sorry, which of the following are reasons for using the home-based care model for COVID-19? Option A, to prevent onward transmission of COVID-19. B, to help with early identification of persons who, who need oxygen therapy. C, to the healthcare system, so that the healthcare system can focus on patients with the most severe COVID-19 cases, D, all of the above. So we have about 83 participants on the call and less than 30 have voted. So I'll just leave this for a few seconds to invite a few more um, votes. It's quite interesting the responses that we're seeing. I cannot tell which answer the majority are going for at the moment. Okay, please let us vote. No voter apathy. We are at 50%, under 50% now. Okay, so I'll go ahead to display the results with the hands so that you take a look at the, the responses. Great, thank you. So um, answer D got 53%. And then answer C got 31%, and then the other, two, uh, the other two got fewer. So most people thought it was all of the above. Great. So the goals of home-based care are threefold. So you wanna uh, identify early and initiate treatment for people with hypoxemia, because this will help prevent further clinical deterioration. We wanna ensure the people who are actively infected are isolating in a safe manner, and also that they, it prevents further onward transmission of their infection. And we want to offload the healthcare system so that the health workers can focus on those who need the care the most. So the home-based care uh, package consists of a home risk assessment, patient education and risk communication, including information on infection prevention and when to um, contact health facilities or, or to contact the, the home-based care staff or health facilities for, for care, even outside of the routinely scheduled visits. Um, hygiene and personal protective equipment for the home setting. A daily symptom assessment to detect early deter uh, clinical deterioration. And then linkage to a medical liaison for referral and this is typically a person who is associated with the, uh, the district health office, who's a healthcare worker designated to assess uh, patients in the home-based care setting who, who may need, uh, who may need uh, additional uh, healthcare. So here's poll question number two. Should I go ahead and read it or? Please go ahead and read it, Doug. Sure. So CM is a 58-year-old woman with fever, myalgias, and headache for three days duration. She is normally a healthy woman. In a local health facility, she tests positive for SARS-CoV-2 on rapid antigen test. Would you recommend, oh, sorry, Ms. Mwafe for home-based care? CM is a 58-year-old woman with fever, myalgias, and headache for three days duration. She is normally a healthy woman at a local health facility, she tests positive for SARS-CoV-2 on rapid antigen test. Would you recommend her for home-based care? We have eight, eight votes out of 97. Okay, so dear network, let us vote to understand the, 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 the knowledge gap on this uh, particular scenario. So I'll give it just about 30 seconds to have more participants vote. We are still under 50% out of the, the 99 connections that we have currently. So I encourage everyone to vote. So we're seeing the pattern of voting. So far, I can reveal that no one said, I don't know. It's still an answer to consider when you do not know. Um, we have a number weighing towards yes, and we still have a significant number um, 
saying no. At least I'm seeing a few that are saying, I don't know. So I will proceed to end the poll in 10 seconds and display the result. Okay, so le then let's see how the, the voting has been. Dr. Hines, you can see there, about 63% thought yes was the correct answer. And we had about 23% that thought no was the correct answer. And a few weighed in on it depends. And one said they did not know. Dr. Hines. Great, thank you. That's a good, that's a good spread. Okay. So when considering whether or not somebody should be uh, cared for in the home-based care model, there's three things we wanna consider. One is the risk factors for severe illness and mortality. The main risk factor for this is related to age. And on the table on the right, it is a uh, table from a study um, showing the hospitalization percent, the ICU, ICU admission percentage, and the case fatality. Um, by age. And if you look at those estimates, there's a, range, there's a range given for each estimate, but if you look at that, there's a real sharp increase in, um, as, as patients get older. Um, so age is the main risk factor, but also comorbidities, um, chronic medical conditions like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer, lung and kidney disease, and others um, are associated with increased risk. HIV is a bit, um, there's sort of mixed evidence. I mean, it seems like there may be higher risk with uh, persons living with HIV, but not to the degree that's seen with some of the other risk factors. Um, so it's still an area of active investigation. Um, the person needs to have a safe place to stay. So what that means is, you know, they have a, their way to separate themselves from other household members so that they can help prevent transmission in those household members. But they also need access to basic necessities and then personal protective equipment to help them prevent uh, further transmission. And there should be a caregiver who's able to take care of those basic needs for them while, while they are isolating, while they're actively infected. And that caregiver should uh, not be someone who's at increased risk of severe disease were they to become infected. So these are three different guidelines in Zambia that, uh, that discuss home-based care. Um, there's the clinical guidelines, the integrated guidelines and standard operating procedures, and then also specific guidelines on the home management of COVID-19. So these, uh, these resources are available for those who are interested in further reading. Um, so the next two slides are just basically conceptual slides to help guide, um, to guide districts and provinces in terms of developing a home-based care approach. It's not necessarily prescriptive as to the cutoffs, but it's just to kind of help you guys think about how you may want to set up your system. And again, we'll hear from Lusaka and Southern provinces regarding the, uh, how, they're, how they're doing this. But basically, uh, patients can be spread into three different, or sorry, four different tiers, um, with tier one being, you know, there's a low level of caution. They're, they're young, they don't have any comorbidities, and they're asymptomatic. Tier two is medium level of caution. So they're maybe a little bit older or they, um, but they don't have any medical comorbidities and they only have mild symptoms. Um, tier three is someone who has higher caution. So they're older, they have more severe symptoms or just some, uh, a, a clinician that, you know, deems them into be in tier three because they're concerned about them for some reason. And then tier four is the highest risk. And they're, they're uh, people with severe symptoms, the people with comorbidities associated with COVID, uh, with increased COVID severity, they're frail, um, or they don't have a place where they can stay safely. Um, those that would be tier tier four. And so this slide, I'm not going to harp on this too much. There, there's a flow diagram that's kind of detailed, um, and this this is available um, for sharing if people want it after the call. But basically, the idea with home based care, it's 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 simple. Um, but, but on day one, you know, there's an in-person visit um, to assess them. And then, you know, depending on which tier the person falls into, they can be followed by phone or by in-person visits um, throughout the, the course of their illness. Typically, what's recommended is 10 days of follow-up. And um, during those visits, the, 
person is asked about symptoms to identify any worsening clinical, um, clinical status. Um, they also, if, if available, a pulse oximeter is used to actually measure their blood oxygen levels to identify uh, patients with hypoxemia, even happy hypoxemia. And then on day 10, they finish home-based care and they can, they can end their isolation. They don't need a test to get out of isolation because we know now from, from COVID that typically people with mild COVID shed virus for at most seven days. So that day 10 gives, builds in a bit of a buffer to ensure that they're no longer infectious. Um, so there's no role for doing a test at the end of home-based care. Um, but if they are still having fever, they, then, um, then home-based care should continue um, in, in a small number of people that may have that situation. But otherwise, day 10 is when we recommend ending home-based care. So key, you know, key to assessing patients in, in a home-based care setting is assessing their dyspnea um, or their symptoms of shortness of breath. Mild dyspnea is common in COVID, but it also can suggest the progression of pulmonary inflammation, which may be a harbinger for worsening of their clinical status. So um, on the slide shows a question you may want to ask them. Um, have you developed any difficulty with uh, breathing other than associated with coffee? Um, and so then if, if yes, then you ask them to, to describe it and you really want to understand like, how, like when they're describing it, are they short of breath trying to explain it? I've also shown some additional follow-up questions that home-based care uh, community health workers may want to ask to assess the dyspnea. I won't read those now, but these slides will be shared. And then you can, you can grade the dyspnea as mild, which is basically you know, mild shortness of breath that doesn't interfere with the daily activities. Moderate is it creates some limitation in their daily activities. And then severe dyspnea is when somebody has shortness of breath at rest. Pulse oximetry can be used in home-based care. Um, and a reason that you may wanna use that is because of this association with happy hypoxia or silent hypoxia, which is basically patients appear well, they don't have the typical signs and symptoms of low blood oxygen levels like rapid breathing or subjective shortness of breath, but they have low oxygen levels when measured. Um, it's a simple procedure. And so um, we're working with, with partners to help try to scale this, this intervention in the community in Zambia. I have a picture of a pulse oximeter on the slide, and it's important to point out that there's two numbers on the pulse oximeter, and it's important to, to know the distinction because if you misread it, you could also uh, mistakenly think somebody has a low oxygen level. The first is the uh, O2 saturation level, which is read as the SpO2, um, and that's shown at 96% on this one. And then there's also the uh, heart rate or the BPM, that's 86. So you want to make sure when you're using a pulse oximeter that you know that you know how to use it and read it correctly so that you don't misread the numbers. So here's poll question number three. Which of the following situations would warrant referral from home-based care to a health facility? Patient reports difficulty breathing while at rest. The patient's wife reports uh, difficulty arousing the patient. The pulse oximeter reads SpO2 equal to 85%. There was no one available to help the patient care for herself. Which of the following situations would warrant referral from home-based care to a health facility? The patient reports difficulty breathing while at rest. The patient's wife reports difficulty arousing the patient. The pulse oximeter reads SpO2 equal to 85%. There is no one available to help the patient care for herself. Thank you so much. So we have close to 105 uh, participants who can call. And so far, only 44 have voted, less than 50%. I encourage everyone to participate in the voting. And also as the voting is going on, I, I'd like to remind the network that if you have a question, you could actually post it in the chat box. Um, our panel of experts, and I will also take note of the questions to float to the, the, the didactic presenter as well as the other experts on the call. I also would like to recognize that uh, Dr. Tamba Tamba, one of our experts has joined. So we'll be hearing from her about the Lusaka experience. So getting back to our poll, just, about 53% have called, 
with um, a number weighing towards option E, but would like to see a bit more people participating in the vote. I will be ending the poll in the next 10 seconds. Dr. Hines, I'm sure you, you, you can see the trend of the voting pattern. Okay, so this is how we have performed on this poll. 78% uh, of the participants thought uh, that voted thought E was the correct answer, saying any of the above. And we had 21% that thought uh, you'd only respond once the patient reports difficulty in breathing while at rest. So Dr. Dr. Hines, please shed more light on, on this poll. Thank you. So on this slide, it shows uh, reasons to refer somebody to the uh, hospital from home-based care. So if they're reporting moderate to severe dyspnea, as was defined on the previous slide, if they have a O2 sat of less than 90% on room air, regardless if they're having symptoms or not from that, if they have alterations in their mentation or other signs of hypoperfusion or hypoxia, so they're confused and Presumptively, if somebody is confused, you're going to think that that's because they're having low oxygen in their blood, and so that is not, that's preventing their brain from functioning properly. So confusion, changes in their behavior, or if you can't arouse them. Also, other signs of hypoperfusion might be hypotension, falls, cyanosis, um, decreased urination, which is anuria, or chest pain, or any other concerning feature um, that the home-based care team deems were, warrants a referral to a hospital. So briefly, this slide shows recommendations on PPE for home-based care. I'm not gonna go through this because um, you can look at it when the slides are shared, but most important is to have adequate protection of your face using uh, a mask. What we recommend is using a surgical or medical mask covered by a cloth mask to help uh, make sure that it fits well. That's that's the recommendation from, from us. So this is the last slide, um, summary of the key points. So most persons who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 experience a mild disease, which is characterized by asymptomatic or mild symptoms, and they do not require hospitalization. So the home-based care model seeks to identify those people who are in the community who need hospitalization early so that they, we can prevent further deterioration. We want to isolate people so that we can prevent further transmission of their infections. And we want to offload the healthcare system to enable it to serve those who truly do need care in the hospital. So the home-based care model is an important part of the clinical and public health system in Zambia's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, oh, this is my last slide. It's not related to home-based care, but it's a reminder to all healthcare workers to get vaccinated. Uh, vaccines work. Um, they will help um, prevent you from becoming sick with COVID. And if um, you do become sick, they will uh, help ensure that you don't have severe disease. So please do get vaccinated uh, for COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hines, for that, uh, that presentation and also sticking to the allocated time. I have noticed uh, with interest that today's session, we, we've not had so many responses in the chat. Um, it, it's, it's a sign that um, the presentation was either well presented or maybe people have not understood anything. So at this point, allow me to invite the network. Anyone who has a question for Dr. Hines could just raise their hand and um, and, 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 and submit your question so that it can be adequately tackled. While we are at it, uh, we'll be inviting Dr. Tambatamba shortly to just give us an account of how the home-based care models have been implemented in Lusaka province. Um, I do not see the representative from Southern province, but as soon as I take note of him or her, I will call upon them to also give us that um, that account of how it's been implemented in the first two waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. Are there any questions from the network or any comments, additions?
All right. Just also to remind everyone to submit your attendance by following the link that's been posted in the chat, and we will take note of uh, your attendance for today's session. So at this point, allow me to invite uh, Dr. Tamba Tamba just to give us an overview on the experience of implementing home-based care in Lusaka province. Dr. Tamba Tamba. Okay, as good afternoon, Dr. Tamba Tamba. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Okay, um, so <clears throat> just a bit of an overview, Osaka province um, was given the mandate to implement home-based care <clears throat> for COVID-19. And um, we are basically providing more of technical support at this point with uh, some community partners who have been assigned to provide the direct uh, service delivery uh, with the support of uh, CDC, of course. So we have Circle of Hope who are doing health promotion messages um, within the communities. And uh, we have DAPP, DAP, implementing the home-based care model in the, in the province, particularly Lusaka district. Most of the services that we're implementing are focused around home risk assessment, patient education and risk communication, hygiene and personal protective equipment um, supply and education, as well as monitoring of daily symptoms and liaison between the medical staff at the health facility and appropriate referral where needed. We are also coordinating uh, the structures that are providing these services as a technical support partner. So we help with collecting daily reports through our m and &E unit. Uh, we've even created like a WhatsApp forum where we are collecting um, information from different groups in the community and at the facility. We have also planned for monthly meetings for community health workers to review their monthly performance with regards to home-based care. And of course, this meeting also helps them to share their experiences and challenges in the areas that they are working. And we also encourage them to have some weekly planning meetings um, and reporting to, to their respective facilities and upwards to the district and PHO. And then um, some of the activities that we are involved in, especially in Lusaka district, you know that Lusaka district is divided further into sub districts for ease of management. And that has helped us to really get down to where we need to be in the community. And uh, as such, each sub-district is involved in providing or conducting community risk assessments and communication under the home-based care model. We've trained about 180 healthcare workers from three districts and six sub-districts, the three districts being uh, Kafiwe, Chongwe, Lusaka, sorry, Kafiwe, Chongwe, Chilanga, including the six sub-districts of Lusaka. Um, including, we also trained them apart from COVID-19, we've trained them in TB infection and control um, support with support from the CDC COAG funds. While um, using the same funds, we facilitated the, the uh, application or rather the conducting of a needs assessment for each of these districts that I mentioned, so that we just understand how, um, how far or how much need there is in each of these facilities and districts with regards to infection prevention. They are at varying levels of, of need, as you may be aware, especially where we know that Lusaka district has received quite a lot of support from partners other than the ones that we are working with. So they may be at a better level uh, than even some of the districts that are in the rural areas, the Chongwe, Chilanga, and, um, and Kafiwe. So there was really a big need for us to understand where these districts and some districts are. And then through the PHO, we conduct uh, site, site mentorship, as well as uh, creating rapid response teams in each of the districts to ensure that it helps them in active case finding. So, so far, um, I don't know how much time I have, but so far we have seen or screened over 500,000 clients and uh, of these 210,000 or more, have actually been eligible for uh, HBC 
Um, others will refer to the health facility about over a thousand through the home-based care model. And um, of the ones that we screened, only a quarter, about 143,000 were eligible for testing and were actually tested during this period. Um, we've been seeing the numbers change with time. And as you can imagine right now, there are more that we are seeing, of course, in the home-based care model, considering that um, there are more that are testing positive and there are more that are needing care even in their homes. To help us implement these activities, we have created multidisciplinary teams, which include surveillance people, public health nurses, EHTs, clinicians, MRTs, um, mentors, community-based organizations and community health workers as well. So the public health nurses we found have actually been very useful in, sorry. Public health nurses have been useful in, in ensuring that they're coordinating these activities at sub-district level. Lusaka district is lucky to have public health nurses in their catchment areas. So these have been very useful in coordinating the HPC activities um, in their sub-districts. And of course, because of the trainings that we've been doing for the community healthcare workers, they've become very experienced and uh, are able to actually follow up our clients uh, in their homes. They're doing it physically and some of them who are not so sick are followed up via phone um, or otherwise. And these community health workers are provided with what is needed to actually provide the care to the patient in the home. Uh, the, the, the pulse oximeters that Heinz talked about are given to the healthcare, uh, community healthcare workers, and they're actually monitoring some of these patients within their homes. Um, then of course, other medical supplies are also part of a kit that they carry around in case some resuscitation is needed at that level. And they are working very closely with the healthcare workers um, at the health facilities. So I don't know if there's more to be said, but uh, we have a limited number, maybe just to talk about a few challenges. We have a limited number of community healthcare workers. So we can't have them everywhere where we need them. And of course, we also have a challenge in ensuring that the equipment and supplies that we provide them or that, that they need to actually use in the community are always available and always functional. So we are consistently running out of, say, batteries for the pulse oximeters, and they're not enough to go around. If we were to cover our patients the way we would want it to be, we would need more of these supplies at that level. And then, of course, um, having to choose supervisory capacity from the health facility some are so engaged in work that is going on at the health facility that they may not really have time to give that support to the community health workers on the ground and give them that oversight that is needed to make sure that quality of care is being provided in the community. Um, maybe I should stop there unless there are questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamba Tamba, for that account. Maybe a quick question from me is, um, what is your comment about how effective home-based care has been in uh, reducing the burden on the, the, the designated COVID centers? That is a question for you. And then before you respond to that one, there are some questions in the chat. There's, uh, there are some coming in from Brianna who was asking, if someone needs to be moved from home-based care to a facility, what is the recommended mechanism? Personal transport, ambulance, or taxi? I can see Dr. Hines had um, submitted a response to, to that question. Maybe Dr. Hines, you could just uh, echo your response for the benefit of the other participants. Sure. Um, I, I said it depends on the acuity of the patient. So the patient may have an indication for um, admission, but they may not be, you know, acutely decompensating. And so in that, in that instance, a personal, a personal vehicle might be appropriate if it's readily available. But if the patient's unstable or there is no transport, an ambulance might be more appropriate. The one uh, thing to, to con last thing to convey is that taking like public transit is not recommended because that risks exposing other people to the virus from that person who's infected. So that should not be used to transport patients. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Heinz. Dr. Tambatamba, a quick comment on this, the, the strain on the designated COVID centers with the implementation of the home-based care model. Um, I will say something, but I can see that we have uh, Matron Ada Zulu, who is one of those coordinating, say, in Lusaka district, and I'll allow her to say something as well. She has a hand, hand up for a question, I'm sure, but I will ask her to also speak to this. And then I also have Dr. Mwape, I think, on the call, who has been helping our provincial health office to coordinate home-based care in our province uh, under the COAG. So basically, I know that um, sometimes we get to feel like the home-based care is not functioning as well as it should, especially at a time like now, when our hospitals are filled to capacity. We get sometimes comments like, what is happening in the community and all that. And even the teams on the ground sometimes tend to feel that they're not being appreciated as much as they should be. I can assure you they are holding the fort so much. If they did not, I don't think we'd be seeing, I think that what we're seeing now would just be a fraction of what, what it should be if there was nothing going on in home-based care. So it is providing a lot of impact. If you go to the health facilities, there are fewer people coming to the health facilities because of the work that is being done in the community. We're not saying we're working 100% way it should be, but I think they are putting in their best to ensure that not as many people are coming to the health facility as, as, um, as would have happened if these people are not going to their homes. And they get assurance when people come to their homes with a little bag of care um, and also the, the counseling that happens when they meet them uh, face to face in their homes. Um, so I think it does have impact. But I'll ask Aida Zulu from Lusaka district to speak to this as well. Dr. Mwape, if you're on the call, kindly join in as well. Let's have Aida Zulu say something. Thank you very much, Dr. Tambatamba. Indeed, just uh, like Dr. Tambatamba responded, uh, home-based care have really worked so hard and uh, the team that is on the ground has really helped. We are receiving a lot of calls for people to just be supported in the facility. So like Dr. Tambatamba said, we've got quite a number of people who are out there and who have actually recognized that they would want to be nursed actually even in the homes. Those um, we seem to have lost uh, Sister Aida Zulu. Care. The teams that have been there have the know how managing a patient, doing the pulse of the, the, the saturations, understanding the saturations, the temperatures in the home, and also getting. So as the teams are going actually out in the field, they are go as a team. There's a team, like the clinician, the nurse, and the actually the community. And at times, even the calls that are being done, uh, effective, you may find that just a cause that are being done, people are even just getting more better because they are feeling psychological care is also being done with them because it's like you are being called all the time. And the other thing that is actually happening under HBC is actually where even people who know now that there is home-based care are actually looking for teams. They'll ask you to say, do we have a team in Chelston? You give them a numbers for the Chelston and they're going to be assisted. Others have asked, what about Kamnyama? What about, so we've been given because we've got designated people working with the HBC community volunteers, the public health nurses and so forth and the teams. So once we identify, we, we've got these teams that are there. So we just give a number. So when you receive a call, okay, we need an HBC, somebody who supported at home. We just come in, connect to the people. So okay. that's actually assisted. Others have actually, actually not to go there. So that is what is happening under HB. So there's a, the, when you look at the strain in the hospital, all these, if they were at the hospital, we're not going to actually to cope because we have got we are overwhelmed, but because quite a number actually being managed in their homes, in their home setup, and it's actually doing very well. Every Thank day we are so close. Yeah. Now my question was, uh, I wanted to say we have, we, 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 with Dr. Matama, Dr. Mwape, maybe we drive something on how we can link up the, those who are testing in the private. You find that it's taking time for us to actually engage with those that have um, tested in the private. For, the, for those who are testing in the facility, government facilities, it has been more and more easier. So that's what I wanted to comment. 
Thank you so much, Sister Aida Zulu, for, for the, the, the description of how home-based care is happening in Lusaka district. And also thank you for the question or bringing out the discussion on the private facilities, which really brings me to the next point of discussion, which is the engagement of private institutions like pharmacies, as well as um, private hospitals. But before we, we actually get into that discussion, uh, I'd like to find out uh, from in Southern Province, are there any additional experiences you've had with respect to home-based care that you'd like to share besides what Lusaka Province has highlighted? Southern Province? I know Southern Province is supposed to be represented by Dr. Sika Zuliapa, but anyone from Southern Province? Uh, yes, yes I have to. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Doc. Dr. Skazi, yeah. Okay, I think as Southern Province, um, we're just slightly behind um, in terms of uh, actualizing the home-based care. We're still in the preliminary stages. Um, we've done all the trainings and, and all. I think currently, this is what we're doing now. We're training the community health workers. We've managed to get the power oximeters, the bicycles, and all the manuals. Everything is done. So we're just winding up with... Um, those trainings for the community health workers. So we should be able to start very soon on the actualization of the home-based care program. Um, other than that, I think I would allow Dr. Dunka also to comment on any additions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Dunka. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, people. Um, so, just like uh, Dr. Skazwe has uh, um, uh, alluded to, in Southern Province, we have moved quite a bit in implementing, though we haven't done the actual implementing. I could uh, share what we have done so far if there was time, but maybe we can just add that we are already, we are already doing the home-based care model in Southern Province, where we have people who are in the community being managed uh, under community model by community health workers who are supervised by the neighborhood health committees. So in Southern, part of what we did was to ensure that as the community health workers are going in the community, the neighborhood health committees are fully functional. So in all the districts, we have established the neighborhood health committees that are fully functional and supported. So these community health workers then are linked to this neighborhood health committee for their protection because we are in the volatile period of campaigns. So they need to be identified in the communities. So these are linked to the neighborhood health committees and then they are performing their duty in the neighborhood health committees. So we did work out a system on how it work. If you can allow me, I can share just how the system is going to work in Southern Province. May I go ahead to do that, sir? Yes, please. In, in, in under three minutes, we can accommodate okay. that. I'm only going to talk about one slide. So while the slide is being put up, um, Dr. Francis Mwape, as well as um, other members of uh, Lusaka Provincial Health Office, please prepare to give us some responses on how the experience has been interacting with private facilities and what you would suggest we do and replicate in other areas to ensure that we optimize the engagement of private facilities. Dr. Hadunka, you can, you can proceed with the slide. I'm sure you can see our slide there. You yes. can do it? Yes. Okay, so this is how our model is going to work. So at the bottom here where you are seeing villages, we are also including compounds for cities and towns. So the neighborhood health committee will work in those villages and each neighborhood health committee has a, a number of community health workers. These ones feed the rural health centers or the urban health centers who report up to the district. But we have the hospitals. There was a question about what happens to when we discharge. So first of all, when we find someone with triage and find someone with COVID, once they test COVID, we link them to the community health workers in the neighborhoods who we monitor every day. 
for pulse oximetry and the temperature. If there is any need for admission, they will uh, alert the health center, who will then alert the hospital to, create, to find the space at the hospital for us to admit this person who needs admission. And this happens also if there is a discharge from any of the hospitals, they will alert the health center where this person is going and the neighborhood health committee so that the community health worker is alerted. So this is how the whole system is integrated in Southern province. Uh, as regards to how the, 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 the whole system works, we have three partners managing this. We have the circles of hope for sensitization and community mobilization. We have the uh, DAPTC managing the community health workers. And then we have the provincial health office managing the overall uh, oversight of the project. So we are working in this format. I would have made a much longer presentation, but we also developed the SOPs specifically to manage this COVID-19 home-based care activity. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hadunka, for, for really Maybe highlighting. Our provincial director is with me. He could add if I left anything. OK, Dr. Monze, any quick? comment or addition? I think essentially Dr. Hadunka has given a picture of how we would want to do it. Um, the only, I think, things we are now clearing up are that uh, we, we want everybody to work in the same line. We have DAP now with us. They've brought their community health workers who we are training, and we hope to deploy them in the neighborhood health committees which have been chosen we are hoping um, um, circles of hope can quickly also tell us the numbers and we take the community health workers through so that as they move they are very sure of what they are they are doing of course community sensitization will come on board as all these get into their various neighborhood health committees we hope to see by monday uh, we, we hope by Monday this, this, this can become a reality. It has taken us a lot of time, um, but we, we want to do the correct thing. We submit. Thank you so much, Dr. Monze, for, for that comment. And also, it's very encouraging for us to know that we have the support from the level of your office in implementing these home-based care approaches. Um, I'll invite Dr. Mwape to just give us an, a comment on what the experience has been in Lusaka in terms of engaging private facilities like private hospitals as well as pharmacies because they are critical in the implementation of the home-based care model. Dr. Mwape, any few words? Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, for Lusaka province, we are aware that uh, the private doctors, the private facilities and private pharmacies were left out initially. And one of the reasons was that uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, testing in private hospitals was not being done as much as it is being done now. So going forward, what we what we are what we've done now is that we, we using the sub district linkages that we have, each of the private hospitals is, is linked to a private to a sub district. So using our public health uh, specialists and nurses, we will, we, we will link our home based care services to all these private hospitals that that belong to each sub district. And also as a Ustaga province, we have a very active WhatsApp group with um, a lot of our private doctors and uh, facilities. So it's we, we, it's something that we we want to explore so that we 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 expose the the services that we're doing under home based care. Additionally, we've mentioned that the Circle of Hope is doing the sensitization, and we are just having trainings with the the teams from Circle of Hope. So we hope that this will also add on to the the sensitization of private hospitals and pharmacies. Thank you, Doctor. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Mwape. At this juncture, we have under five minutes to wrap up our session for the day. Um, I'd like to just invite Dr. Heinz to give us some concluding remarks on today's topic of discussion, and we'll wrap it up for the day. Dr. Heinz. Uh, thank you very much. And do we want to go over the question responses also quickly? I have those available. Um, yes, please. Let me let me let me quickly display uh, the results for the the, the polls. Okay. Yeah, so I'm displaying poll number one, which was which of the following are the reasons for using the home-based care models for COVID-19? So the answer to this question was, was number uh, or letter D, all of the above. So we wanna, um, we wanna prevent those who are infected from transmitting the disease. We wanna also identify the small minority that are gonna need um, hospital care um, early so that we can intervene. And we also wanna uh, set up a system that helps offload the healthcare system so they can focus on the most severe illnesses. Thank you so much. So poll question number two read, CM, a 58 year old woman with fever, myalgia and headache for three days duration. She's normally a healthy woman at local facility. She tests positive for SARS-CoV-2 using the rapid antigen test. Would you recommend Ms. Mwape for home-based care? Yeah, again, I apologize. I, I meant to take out the, uh, the name Mwape there just so it was less you know, I mean, it was it was a made up scenario, but obviously um, better not to use a, a name that could be mistaken. Um, so the, um, anyway, the answer is C, it depends. So this was a bit of a trick question, um, but the, the point or the learning point from this question is that, you know, the home-based care model is, um, is, is that it's a model. It's not necessarily prescriptive and it needs to be somewhat fluid to adapt to the COVID situation. So right now we're experiencing a third wave with really massive um, um, case counts every day and hospitals are really strained. And so there may be some, you may wanna uh, adjust the, the, the criteria for entry into home-based care based on the epidemiologic situation. So this woman, CM has a risk factor, which is her, some, you know, her somewhat older age of 58. Uh, so she, that, you know, that does raise your concern that she's at higher risk for severe disease but she also has only mild illness. She doesn't have any severe symptoms. Um, and so she could potentially be a candidate for home-based care, but really that's gonna depend upon the epidemiologic situation at the time. Um, so that's, that, was, that was the learning point from this question is it depends. Thank you so much. And the last poll question uh, read, which of the following situations would warrant referral from home-based care to a health facility? So the majority of the respondents said E, any of the above. Your comment, Dr. Hines? Yes, yeah, so E is the correct answer, so thank you. And really just wanted to hit home um, sort of the different things that the, uh, the healthcare workers should be thinking about when they're assessing a patient. So any um, uh, you know, severe dyspnea, so I feel short of breath at rest, um, difficulty arousing the patient, which is indicative of low blood oxygen levels to the brain, um, a pulse oximetry reading, so like an objective indication that they're, they have low oxygen levels, or if that person just can't safely stay in their home, those would all be reasons to, to refer them to a health facility. Um, so just trying to hit home those points. And so, I mean, with that, I can, I can kind of summarize the, the, the main takeaways, which were, were captured by the poll questions. But they really, you know, the home-based care model is, is a critical piece of the, of, of the, of the clinical and public health system for COVID because so many people can be safely managed at home. Um, but that there is, there is a good way to do it. And that this, the presentation hopefully provided the information for, uh, for those to, to help implement a, a home-based care model in their, in their areas. And it was great to have the, the information from Lusaka, from Dr. Tamba Tamba, Dr. Mwape um, in Southern, uh, um, uh, Dr. Monze and uh, Dr. Hanuka and, and others um, about what, what they're actually doing on the ground because 
the, the model, you know, needs to be adapted to the situation um, and, the, and the resources, but we hope that this system can be utilized throughout the country so that we can ensure that um, people with COVID are, are cared for appropriately. So with that, I, I would thank everybody for their time and I'm happy to answer any questions by email and these slides will be circulated on, on relevant WhatsApp channels. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Dr. Dr. Hines, and also like to thank all the subject matter experts that joined us on the call today. Um, we would also like to thank all the participants that took part to ask questions in the chat box as well as uh, provide feedback. Uh, so this is this marks the end of the third in the series on the COVID-19 response echo sessions. This has been Dr. Singini David from Cyrus Tibelon. We are signing out. Thank you. Have a good day.